A.V. Dicey, Introduction to the Study of the Law of the Constitution Introduction Aim The Law of the Constitution was first published in 1885. The book was based on lectures delivered by me as Venerian Professor of English Law. The lectures were given and the book written with the sole object of explaining and illustrating three leading characteristics in the existing Constitution of England. They are now generally designated as the Sovereignty of Parliament, the Rule of Law and the Conventions of the Constitution. The book, therefore, dealt with the main features of our constitution as it stood in 1884-85, to that is, 30 years ago. The work has already gone through seven editions. Each successive edition, including the seventh, has been brought up to date, as the expression goes, by amending it so as to embody any change in or affecting the constitution which may have occurred since the last preceding edition. On publishing the eighth and final edition of this treatise, I have thought it expedient to pursue a different course. The constant amendment of a book, though published in successive editions during 30 years, is apt to take from it any such literary merits as it may originally have possessed. Recurring alterations destroy the original tone and spirit of any treatise which has the least claim to belong to the literature of England. The present edition, therefore, of the Law of the Constitution is in substance a reprint of the seventh edition. It is, however, accompanied by this new introduction, whereof the aim is to compare our constitution as it stood and worked in 1884 with the constitution as it now stands in 1914. It is thus possible to take a general view of the de development of the Constitution during a period filled with many changes both of law and of opinion. My readers are thus enabled to see how far either legislation or constitutional conventions have during, have during the last 30 years extended or, it may be, limited the application of the principles which in 1884 lay at the foundation of our whole constitutional system. This introduction, therefore, is in the main a work of historical retrospection. It is impossible, however, nor perhaps would it be desirable were it possible, to prevent a writer's survey of the past from exhibiting or betraying his anticipations of the future. The topics here dealt with may be thus summed up. The sovereignty of Parliament, the rule of law, the law and the conventions of the Constitution, new constitutional ideas, general conclusions. Sovereignty of Parliament the sovereignty of Parliament is, from a legal point of view, the dominant characteristic of our political institutions, and my readers will remember that Parliament consists of the King, the House of Lords and the House of Commons acting together. The principle, therefore, of parliamentary sovereignty means neither more nor less than this, namely, that Parliament has the right to make or unmake any law whatever, and further, that no person or body is recognised by the law of England as having a right to override or set aside the legislation of Parliament and further that this right or power of Parliament extends to every part of the King's dominions. These doctrines appear in the first edition of this work, published in 1885. They have been repeated in each successive edition published up to the present day. Their truth has never been denied. We must now, however, consider whether they are an accurate description of parliamentary sovereignty as it now exists in 1914, and here it should be remarked that parliamentary sovereignty may possibly at least have been modified in two different directions, which ought to be distinguished. It is possible, in the first place, that the constitution or nature of the sovereign power may have undergone a change. If, for example, the King and the Houses of Parliament had passed a law abolishing the House of Lords and leaving supreme legislative power in the hands of the King and of the House of Commons, any one would feel that the sovereign to which parliamentary sovereignty had been transferred was an essentially different sovereign from the King and the two Houses which in 1884 possessed supreme power. It is possible in the second place that, since 1884, the Imperial Parliament may, if not in theory yet in fact, have ceased as a rule to exercise supreme legislative power in certain countries subject to the authority of the King. Let us consider carefully each of these two possibilities. Possible change in constitution or character of the Parliamentary Sovereign. Effect of the Parliament Act, 1911. The matter under consideration is in substance whether the Parliament Act has transferred legislative authority from the King and the two Houses of Parliament to the King and the House of Commons. The best mode of giving an answer to this question is first to state broadly what were the legislative powers of the House of Lords immediately before the passing of the Parliament Act, 18th August 1911, and next to state the main direct and indubitable effects of that Act on the legislative power of the House of Lords and of the House of Commons respectively. The state of things immediately before the passing of the Parliament Act. No Act of Parliament of any kind could be passed without the consent thereto both of the House of Lords and of the House of Commons. No doubt the House of Lords did very rarely either alter or reject any money bill, and though the Lords have always claimed the right to alter or reject such a bill, they have only on very special occasions exercised this power. No doubt again their Lordships have, at any rate since 1832, acknowledged that they ought to pass any bill deliberately desired by the nation, and also have admitted the existence of a more or less strong presumption that the House of Commons in general represents the will of the nation, and that the Lords ought, therefore, in general to consent to a bill passed by the House of Commons, even though their Lordships did not approve of the measure. 
But this presumption may, they have always maintained, be rebutted if any strong ground can be shown for holding that the electors did not really wish such a bill to become an act of Parliament. Hence, bill after bill has been passed by their lordships, of which the House of Lords did not in reality approve. It was, however, absolutely indubitable up to the passing of the Parliament Act that no act could be passed by Parliament without obtaining the consent of the House of Lords. Nor could any one dispute the legal right or power of the House, by refusing such assent, to veto the passing of any act of which the House might disapprove. Two considerations, however, must be taken into account. This veto, in the first place, has at any rate since 1832 been, as a rule, used by the Lords as a merely suspensive veto. The passing of the Great Reform Act itself was delayed by their Lordships for somewhat less than two years, and it may well be doubted whether they have, since 1832, ever, by their legislative veto, delayed legislation really desired by their electors for as much as two years. It must again be remembered that the Lords, of recent years at least, have at times rejected bills supported by the majority of the House of Commons which, as has been proved by the event, had not received the support of the electors. Hence it cannot be denied that the action of the House of Lords has sometimes protected the authority of the nation. The Direct Effects of the Parliament Act Such effects can be summed up in popular and intelligible language, rather than with technical precision, as follows. 1. In respect of any money bill, the Act takes away all legislative power from the House of Lords. The House may discuss such a bill for a calendar month, but cannot otherwise prevent, beyond a month, the bill becoming an Act of Parliament. 2. In respect of any public bill, which is not a money bill, the Act takes away from the House of Lords any final veto, but leaves or gives to the House a suspensive veto. This suspensive veto is secure to the House of Lords because under the Parliament Act Section 2, no such bill can be passed without the consent of the House which has not fulfilled the following four conditions. 1. That the bill shall, before it is presented to the King for his assent, be passed by the House of Commons and be rejected by the House of Lords in each of three successive sessions. 2. That the bill shall be sent up to the House of Lords at least one calendar month before the end of each of these sessions. 3. That in respect of such bill, at least two years shall have elapsed between the date of the second reading of the bill in the House of Commons during the first of those sessions and the date on which it passes the House of Commons in the third of such sessions. 4. That the bill presented to the King for his assent shall be in every material respect identical with the bill sent up to the House of Lords in the first of the three successive sessions, except insofar as it may have been amended by or with the consent of the House of Lords. The History of the Government of Ireland Act 1914, popularly and throughout this introduction generally called the Home Rule Bill or Act, affords good illustrations of the peculiar procedure instituted by the Parliament Act. The Home Rule Bill was introduced into the House of Commons during the first of the three successive sessions on April 11, 1912. It passed its second reading in the House of Commons during that session on May 9, 1912. It was rejected by the House of Lords, either actually or constructively, in each of the three successive sessions. It could not then possibly have been presented to the King for his assent till June the ninth, nineteen fourteen. It was not so present to the King it was not so presented to the King till September eighteenth, nineteen fourteen. On that day, just before the actual prorogation of Parliament in the third session, it received the royal assent without the consent of the House of Lords. It thereby became the Government of Ireland Act nineteen fourteen. The Act, as assented to by the King, was in substance identical with the bill sent up to the House of Lords in the first of the three sessions on january sixteenth, nineteen thirteen. But here we come across the difficulty of amending a bill under the Parliament Act after it had once been sent after it had once been sent up in the third session to the House of Lords. By June 1914, it was felt to be desirable to amend the Home Rule Bill in respect of the position of Ulster. On June 23rd, the government brought into the House of Lords a bill which should amend the Home Rule Act, which was still a bill, and it is difficult to find a precedent for thus passing an act for amending a bill not yet on the statute book. The attempt to carry out the government's proposal came to nothing. On September 18, 1914, the Home Rule Bill became the Home Rule, Home Rule Act, or technically the Government of Ireland Act, 1914, unamended, but on the very day on which the Home Rule Act was finally passed, it was in effect amended by a suspensory act under which the Government of Ireland Act, 1914, cannot come into force until at any rate 12 months from September 18, and possibly will not come into force until the present war has ended. The Suspensory Act evades or avoids the effect of the Parliamentary Parliament Act, but such escape from the effect of a recently passed statute suggests the necessity for some amendment in the procedure created by the Parliament Act. 3. The House of Commons can, without the consent of the House of Lords, present to the King for his assent any bill whatever which has complied with the provisions of the Parliament Act Section 2, or rather which is certified by the Speaker of the House of Commons in the way provided by the Act to have complied with the conditions of the Parliament Act Section 2. The simple truth is that the Parliament Act has given to the House of Commons, or, in plain language, to the majority thereof, the power of passing any bill whatever, provided always that the conditions of the Parliament Act Section 2 are complied with. 
but these provisions do leave to the House of Lords a suspensive veto which may prevent a bill from becoming an Act of Parliament for a period of certainly more and possibly a good deal more than two years. In these circumstances, it is arguable that the Parliament Act has transformed the sovereignty of Parliament into the sovereignty of the King and the House of Commons, but the better opinion on the whole is that sovereignty still resides in the King and the two Houses of Parliament. The grounds for this opinion are, firstly, that the King and the two Houses acting together can most certainly enact or repeal any law whatever without in any way contravening the Parliament Act, and secondly, that the House of Lords, while it cannot prevent the House of Commons from, in effect, passing under the Parliament Act any change of the Constitution, provided always that the requirements of the Parliament Act are complied with, nevertheless can, as long as that Act remains in force, prohibit the passing of any Act, the effectiveness of which depends upon its being passed without delay. Hence, on the whole, the correct legal statement of the actual condition of things is that sovereignty still resides in Parliament, i.e. in the King and the two Houses acting together, but that the Parliament Act has greatly increased the share of sovereignty possessed by the House of Commons and has greatly diminished the share thereof belonging to the House of Lords. Practical change in the area of parliamentary sovereignty, relation of the Imperial Parliament to the Dominions. The term Dominions means and includes the Dominion of Canada, Newfoundland, and Commonwealth of Australia, New Zealand, and the Union of South Africa. Each of the Dominions is a self-governing co colony, i.e. a colony possessed both of a colonial parliament, or representative legislature, and a responsible government, or in other words, of a government responsible to such legislature. Our subject raises two questions. First question. What is the difference between the relation of the Imperial Parliament to a self-governing colony, such e.g. as New Zealand in 1884, and the relation of the same Parliament to the Dominion, e.g. of New Zealand in 1914? Before attempting a direct answer to this inquiry, it is well to point out that in two respects of considerable importance, the relation of the Imperial Parliament to the self-governing colonies, whether called Dominions or not, has in no respect changed since 1884. In the first place, the Imperial Parliament still claims in 1914, as it claimed in 1884, the possession of absolute sovereignty throughout every part of the British Empire, and this claim, which certainly extends to every Dominion, would be admitted as sound legal doctrine by any court throughout the Empire which purported to act under the authority of the King. The constitution, indeed, of a dominion in general originates in and depends upon an act or acts of the imperial parliament, and these constitutional statutes are assuredly liable to be changed by the imperial parliament. Parliament, in the second place, had long before 1884 practically admitted the truth of the doctrine in vain, pressed upon his contemporaries by Burke, when insisting upon the folly of the attempt made by the Parliament of England to exert as much absolute power in Massachusetts as in Middlesex, that a real limit to the exercise of sovereignty is imposed not by the laws of man, but by the nature of things, and that it was vain for a parliamentary or any other sovereign to try to exert equal power throughout the whole of an Im immense empire. The completeness of this admission is shown by one noteworthy fact. The Imperial Parliament in 1884, and long before 1884, had ceased to impose of its own authority and for the benefit of England any tax upon any British colony. The omnipotence, in short, of Parliament, though theoretically admitted, has been applied in its full effect only to the United Kingdom. A student may ask what is the good of insisting upon the absolute sovereignty of Parliament in relation to the Dominions when it is admitted that Parliament never gives, outside the United Kingdom, and probably never will give, full effect to this asserted and more or less fictitious omnipotence. The answer to this suggestion is that students who do not bear in mind the claim of Parliament to absolute sovereignty throughout the whole of the British Empire will never understand the extent to which this sovereign power is on some occasions actually exerted outside the limits of the United Kingdom, nor, though this statement sounds paradoxical, will they understand the limits which, with the full assent, no less of English than of colonial statesmen, are in fact, as regards at any rate the Dominions, imposed upon the actual exercise of the theoretically limitless authority of Parliament. It will be found further that even to the Dominions themselves there is at times some advantage in the admitted authority of the Imperial Parliament to legislate for the whole Empire. In the eyes, any rate, of thinkers who share the moral convictions prevalent in most civilised states, it must seem again that the Imperial Parliament should have been able in 1834 to prohibit the existence of slavery in any country subject to the British Crown, and should be able today to forbid throughout the whole Empire the revival of the slave trade or of judicial torture.